Now, I put this slide up because there's a very big European study just been published. This cost a lot of money. It was called the Interphone Study. It was an epidemiological study where they interviewed thousands of people and examined their health records, found out who'd got a brain tumor, who'd got various kinds of cancers of the ear, and you name it. And they'd ask them about their cell phone use, ask them how much they used the phone, and try to assess, was there any connection between people getting tumors and whether they were excessive cell phones? Well, I've looked at this paper, and I really believe this should have been unequivocal in saying we don't find anything. But it's weasel-worded, even this paper. They looked at lots of things, and what they found was that some cancers occurred slightly more frequently in mobile phone users, and some cancers occurred slightly less frequently in mobile phone users. Well, if you're going to accept that cell phones are bad, results like this would suggest that cell phones are good. The conclusion you would draw by looking at this paper is there's actually nothing there. And this is just the statistical variability of a very difficult study. For example, one Swedish scientist said that he had clear evidence that people who use the phone in the left ear always got brain tumors on the left-hand side of their head. But what makes you suspicious about his study was that people who claimed that got fewer tumors on the other side of their head which would suggest that using a cell phone in your left ear stops you getting a tumor in your right ear. None of this is true. The fact is most people probably don't remember which ear they use, and the results are all as a result of what people call recall bias in these interview-based types of studies. And you know, epidemiology is a bit of a variable science in trying to predict whether there really is a relationship between two things. I mean, look how long it took for people to accept that cigarette smoking caused lung cancer. The odds ratio of getting lung cancer if you smoke compared to if you don't was like 20 to 1. All these studies, if you see a risk, it's like 1.04 to 1 or 1.2 to 1. Or, or in this case, it might be 0.96 to 1. It's just variability around 1, which says there's nothing going on. But I'm afraid there's a lot of scientists who fall into this trap they don't like to be too unequivocal. Yes? I have to ask a question, though. I mean, a true scientific study would have a control group, uh, and uh, you would test people on the left and the right. I mean, you would have a whole range of, is that did that study do that? They did their best. The trouble is, it's getting harder and harder to find anybody who doesn't use a cell phone. But they did. They did attempt to have a control group. They, they interviewed people, and their control group were people who said they didn't use cell phones. So you have to believe them when they say they didn't use cell phones. So the study did its best. I just think it was a very difficult study to draw firm conclusions. But the Europeans spent millions doing it. And I think it's still ongoing. Not all the results are in yet. Of course, I'd like to point to this. You know, somebody did a study recently, and they found that cell phone users didn't get Alzheimer's as much. So guys, pull out your cell phones. It's not good for you any more than it's bad for you because I'm going to show you that there's really no way for it to do anything. You know, it's a communications device. And this is the point you just brought up, the young lady on the back row, that you should, when you're doing an experiment of this kind, you'd like to look at what happens to people who are exposed, and you'd also have a control group that aren't exposed. This is true in any biological experiment of this kind. Usually, you actually have three groups. You have an exposed group, a control group, and you have a sham group. The sham groups are animals you just leave alone in their cages. The control group, you run them through exactly the same protocols as you run through the exposed animals. You just don't actually expose them. Because in these kind of experiments, even handling the animal and putting them in an exposure system and irradiating them or not irradiating them can produce some animal stress. So you produce subtle effects, even when you're not shining any radiation on them, on them at all, because biological systems are very complex. And if any of you had a background in biological studies, most biological studies are carried out, and they'll say that we seem to have a positive finding if they have what's called a 95% confidence. Well, you know, the point is, if you have a 95% confidence limit, that means that 1 in 20 experiments can produce a significant result 
when nothing's happening just because of random chance. And th this is really, these are the studies that get noticed by the media and get lots of attention. Now, it is interesting. You could argue that cell phones might cause all kinds of cancers, but the ones that people worry about is that they cause brain tumors because that's where the phone is, next to your brain. They've actually been worrying about this very rare tumor called an acoustic neurinoma that happens in your ear channel. Very, very rare, but that's another one they've looked at. Well, here's the interesting fact. There's about 4,000 new brain cancer cases in the US each year. It's not increasing. In fact, there's some evidence that worldwide incidence of brain cancer is actually decreasing. Now, if cell phones were dangerous, that doesn't make sense. We should we begin to see an increase. We're not seeing an increase. I think this is very strong evidence, just without doing any e detailed experiments, that if it's not increasing, whatever we're doing to ourselves isn't making us have more brain tumors. Now, there are some professions which have a higher incidence of brain tumor than others. You know, not going to make any comment about physicians and why they get a higher incidence of brain tumors, but this is a statistical fact. And of course, pretty soon, everybody who gets cancer will be a cell phone user. Therefore, they're all caused by the cell phones. Yeah, something that's always bothered me is people talk about brain tumors or ear, oral cancers, but probably 90% of the time, my phone is in my pocket. Wouldn't there be more instances that they be watching for pelvic cancers, people carrying on their belts or in their pockets? Well, you know, believe, yeah. believe it or not, there was a report that Policemen who use radar guns and rest the gun on their crotch when they're not zapping motorists were having a higher incidence of testicular cancer. Of course, it didn't pan out, but that's the kind of thing that gets people's attention. You know, now there is a well-documented case of something that really does cause testicular cancer. People who work in machine shops who used to wipe their hands on their overalls down here, a lot of these machine shop pills and lubricants and the like actually do they are carcinogens, and they did find a higher incidence of testicular cancer in the days when machinists and working on, people working on equipment would do this kind of thing, and they were actually exposing themselves to chemical, chemicals. But, you know, this is the kind of thing you can see that out on the web. You know, this is something you can buy that protects you from your cell phone. Well, I would assure you, if you wrap your cell phone in aluminum foil, you will not be exposed at all, but the phone won't work. <laughs> you know, that... This is, you know, the trouble is people fall for this kind of stuff. I hope none of you are wearing copper bracelets for your rheumatism or magnets in your shoes for arthritis, you know, because those are some more of the, yeah. Uh, are you familiar with a product uh, from Pong Research Corporation? No, I'm not. No. I, I would invite you to go to their website and take a look at the uh, results from CDCOM concerning the uh, redirection of EMF radiation. Okay. Now, lately, people, as well as worrying about their cell phones, they've started to worry about base stations. You know, the base stations are these things you see all over the place, on buildings, on poles. And, of course, the system would not work without them, because when you use your cell phone, you have a wireless signal goes to the nearest base station. And then the signal goes into optical fibers and travels all over the planet to another base station where it hops out through the air and goes to the person you're talking to who's on their mobile phone. Okay, and there's a lot of people out there complaining about base stations, saying that they're a health risk. They're doing this because they think they're ugly, but they want an excuse to not have the base station built in their neighborhood. Believe it or not, the amount of radiation you get from a base station is so low, it's about the same in watts as you get from the visible light reflected off the planet Venus. So if you look up at Venus and you look at the light that's coming, that's about the same radiation level as you might get from your nearest base station. And yeah, they sometimes are ugly, but the cell phone industry is very creative. They design, disguise them to look like other things. Okay? Here is an undisguised base station with all the sectored antennas, probably from two or three cell phone providers on the pole. And I'm sure you've all seen these things on buildings and everywhere. Here's one that looks like a tree, okay? You can get all kinds of creative antenna designs now that are disguised not to appear like cell phone antennas. And I like this one. I mean, this really looks like a cactus, except here's a guy on a cherry picker. He's got 
an access door open in the antenna and he's working on it. <laughs> and of course, it's all, it's like this. You've all heard of NIMBY, haven't you? I just had to put this slide in because a colleague of mine came up with a much better one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I owe this to my very good colleague, Dr. John Mulder, who is in the Medical College of Wisconsin out in Milwaukee. He is a real expert on the biology of all these issues, and he doesn't believe it's a problem any more than I do. But I look at it more from the physicist and engineer standpoint. He looks at it from the biology standpoint. Now, he and I had an interesting study, an interesting case. I want to tell you about this, because this is interesting. Because over the years, I have become reasonably well regarded for the work that I've done in this area, I get occasionally asked to be a legal expert in cases that crop up. Okay? And one of the most interesting ones was this one that I had to deal with in Bermuda. Now you can guess that it's rather nice to have a consulting job in Bermuda. And what happened was, one of the, has anybody been to Bermuda, by the way? No? The biggest, fanciest hotel in Bermuda is the Southampton Princess Hotel. And they have lots of employees. And they have an employee village for these employees. And what happened was that Bermuda Telecommunications, which is one of the cell phone providers in Bermuda, leased some land from the hotel to build this space station. Now, it's not the prettiest base station I've ever seen, but it was within sight of this community of houses where the workers at the hotel lived. And before long, they were up in arms about this, and they started complaining that they were getting headaches, skin rashes, couldn't sleep, you name it. And so they persuaded the hotel to sue the communications company to have the base station removed. In fact, sorry, I get, back, I get the backwards, the wrong way around. The Bermuda Telecommunications sued them not to have the base station take, taken down. It was the other way around. Because the communications company needed this antenna, otherwise they had a dead zone in the middle of the island. And they didn't want the hotel trying to break the lease because the, the phone antenna was actually on the hotel's land. And so, I went to Bermuda and I made measurements around this antenna. I had the latest, greatest measurement equipment. I couldn't measure any fields. They weren't sensitive enough. There was nothing happening. It's interesting. If you look at the pattern of radiation that leaves a base station like this, it's actually quite a bit like a, a donut that goes out horizontally. So in fact, believe it or not, if you stand underneath a base station, there's not really much radiation at all. And in fact, these are what we call the primary radiation lobes. And they get bigger as you go away from the antenna. And they typically reach the ground about three times of the, the height of the antenna away. So I always tell people that people who are worried about their kids being exposed to radiation from base stations should put it right on the roof of the school. Because there's no radiation underneath it. And the, the school gets lots of nice revenue from the phone company putting the antenna on the roof. But I'm sure you've heard about schools up in arms that they're building a base station nearby. And certainly, they won't want it on the roof. They should want it on the roof, because that's the safest place for it to be. OK? Anyway, this went to trial. And the people from the hotel, their lawyer got up, and their experts. And they claimed they had all these physical ailments, and you name it. And we pointed out to the judge that there was really no possible way they could have these ailments. And Bermuda Digital Communications won the case. And interestingly enough, this is what they call the British rule. Because they lost, they had to pay everybody's costs, including our costs and their own. So this is a really good way to discourage frivolous lawsuits. Because if you lose, you pay the other guy's costs as well. 